At this session, I have a very dear friend and one of the people that really, I believe that as a periodontist, as an infant surgeon, most of you are familiar with his amazing researches and works. And if not yet, you have to, because he's one of the leaders in the field of perio and implant and a very highlighted topics he has worked on, on the very important journals in our field of practice. So today my great guest is Dr. Vahid Khoshkam and now joining us from United States. Hello Vahid and welcome. It's really a great honor for me to be a part of this fantastic lineup of speakers. I'm really privileged so thank you so much and uh, I would like to say hi to everyone who is listening to us uh, I hope you guys, uh, you and your family have been safe during this time. Sure. So I'm going to uh, yeah, uh, going to start. So, yeah, before before you start your presentation, uh, first I would like to have your CV for all of our audience. And then we will go to your presentation at the end. We can have a little discussion on the topic also. Dr. Vahid Hoshkam is a remarkably accomplished board certified periodontist with 20 years of experience practicing dentistry. He's a graduate of the prestigious University of Southern California periodontology program where he received his specialty degree. He is also a diplomate of American Board of Periodontology and has published numerous articles with the top ranked dental journals in the world. He lectures internationally, educating other dental practitioners. His experience and expertise in the field has led him to become a leading author in periodontology, writing multiple chapters, as I told you, about the subject. Dr. Khoshkam is a peer reviewer for the Journal of Dental Research, one of the world's most prestigious dental journals and his passion and dedication to his craft has led him to become one of the leading periodontists practicing in the field today. And the topic that he will have for us today is the impact of interim plant and tooth implant distances on marginal bone loss, which I believe is one of the key elements that we need to know and consider for our success, especially in long term of the results. So Dr. Khoshkam, dear Vahid, we are ready for your beautiful presentation and the stage is all yours. Sure. sure, let me just start sharing my screen and so I'm gonna get started. So I'm gonna talk about spatial inter and tooth implant distances and marginal bone loss. So daily millions of implants are being placed in the mouth of the patients uh, no matter what's the design, uh, what's the texture, what's the surface, what's uh, the length. What happens after these implant placement is that a soft tissue seal of about four millimeter in height will get established around these osseointegrated implants. So a preclinical study, as you see, uh, have, has shown that no matter uh, what implant it is, as you can see here, they use a Brownmark implant, a machine surface implant, the old Stroman TPS implant, and the old Astra implant. But what they saw was that after the osteointegration, the soft tissue seal that was formed around these osteointegrated implant was uh, almost the same as you can see in this diagram. So since the alveolar bone crest constitutes the base for this soft tissue seal, any alteration in the level of the alveolar crest might have a negative impact on the integrity of this soft tissue seal. So we have to uh, identify the factors that are uh, responsible for alterations in, mar in uh, marginal bone loss. 
as you can see here, uh, as I mentioned, uh, no matter what implant we use, the process is kind of the same. Here I had a case, a uh, kind of simple case. I placed an uh, internal connection, uh, uh, 3i implant, as you can see, and you see the image of the restoration. And here we can identify kind of that uh, soft tissue seal that I was mentioning. It's the same for this case that I placed a strong and tissue level implant. The process is the same. This is the time of placement, one week post-op, three months, and this is one year post-loading. You see the alveolar bone crest is uh, stable, and this is what we're talking about, that soft tissue seal. So we know that if we, uh, place the implant in the correct position, then it may ensure the uh, optimal condition for both hard and soft tissue. But the problem is here, what is called uh, proper? What's the definition of optimal uh, conditions for implant placement? Actually, a very recently published paper in the Journal of Periodontology have provided us with some new definitions of the pre-implant phenotype that is very interesting. As you see here, they were looking at the creatinized mucosa width, the mucosal thickness, and the supracrestal tissue height, and eventually the pre-implant bone thickness. As far as the creatinized mucosa width, it goes, uh, they defined the width of the creatinized mucosa adequate if it's two millimeter or more. Otherwise, it is considered inadequate. If we look at the mucosal thickness, they have suggested that any mucosal thickness less than two millimeters should be considered thin. For supracrystal tissue height, they suggested that we should consider the supracrystal tissue height as short if it's less than three millimeter and tall if it's three millimeter or more. But here we have to be cautious. When we say it has to be three millimeter or more, it doesn't mean that it can be any number. It cannot exceed uh, some certain number. So we have to be cautious on this matter. It can't be, for example, 10 millimeter of supracrystal tissue height, because otherwise you're gonna have a deep pocket. As far as the pre-implant bone thickness, you know, this is a very interesting topic in the literature. And since uh, 2000, many clinical and preclinical studies have looked at this uh, important factor from the clinical study that was uh, published by a spray at all at 2000 and the preclinical study that was just recently published by Manji et al. in 2019, what they agree upon was that if the pre-implant bone thickness is less than two millimeter, it should be considered thin. So a thick pre-implant bone thickness is two millimeter or more. This is something that we have to bear in our mind, unless the further research changes these parameters or these numbers. So for now, we have to stick to these numbers. So as far as the relationship between the uh, implant and the adjacent tooth and the distances, we actually did a research uh, that was published in 2015 we were looking at the vertical implant position in relationship to the adjacent tooth. So we look at the CEJ of the, the tooth in the posterior area, the whole uh, sites that were investigated were in the posterior area. So uh, also uh, we compared that distance to the platform of that implant that was placed uh, distal to the uh, last tooth and here, as you can see in this diagram, several uh, parameters uh, were of our interest. The CEJ of the tooth, 
the platform of the implant that was placed in the posterior area, the distance between the CEJ and the platform of that implant, and the first bone to implant contact to the platform of the implant. We included several implants. In total, we had 139 implants with different systems. As you can see here, what we saw was that the bone loss on the distal side of the implant was significantly higher compared to the mesial side. And what was more interesting was that we realized when the distance between the CEJ of the tooth and the platform of the implant in distal to that tooth was more than three millimeter, the implant experienced more marginal bone loss. You have to consider this was a radiographic analysis. So whether this predisposes the implant to peri-implantitis or not, uh, was out of the uh, concept of our uh, study. But we definitely saw that we see more bone loss if we place the implants deeper than three millimeter compared to the CEJ of the adjacent tooth. It's a very classic study that shows that if you place the implant in a distance with uh, less than three millimeter, we will see uh, more bone loss in the uh, encountering sites of both implants. So this finding has been argued with a lot of studies afterwards, especially this one. In this study, uh, they use uh, implants with uh, uh, platform switch abutments and they realized the marginal uh, bone level was stable even after 24 months. Even in the situations that the horizontal distance between the implants were less than three millimeter. So probably it's not just the horizontal distance between the implants. There might have been some uh, other factors that are responsible for marginal bone loss that takes place after the uh, implant placement for these multiple unit implant restorations. For example, if you look at this uh, radiograph, you can see that uh, the implants are relatively close. However, the platforms have a significant uh, discrepancy. So we have to find out whether this vertical discrepancy has a detrimental effect on marginal bone loss or not. A retrospective study by Cardor Poli and his co-workers in the University of Gothenburg was uh, conducted in 2003. They look at uh, implant supported restorations, three unit implant supported restorations. They were all Braunemark uh, implants, machine surface implants that no longer we use. However, they had interesting findings uh, they had 28 patients and uh, the study included 105 implants. So that resulted in 70 implant to implant units. What they had as a vertical inter-implant distance was about a millimeter and the horizontal inter-implant distance was a slightly more than three millimeter. What they concluded, it wasn't a very definite conclusion, but what they found was that the both vertical and horizontal uh, differences in implant positions might have a detrimental effect on marginal bone levels in the size that are between the implants after three years of loading. Another study, again, look at the uh, inter-implant distances and the implant tooth distances, but they just look at the horizontal distances. As you can see here, they had uh, 43 patients, 130 astro implants, 67 implant to implant units. And what they found was that the horizontal inter-unit distance well, had a borderline significance. 
So it was not a really uh, significant factor on bone loss. As you can see, based on the p-value. As far as the tooth to implant units, there was no statistically significant association. So they didn't see if the distance between the implant and the tooth had a detrimental effect. We have to keep that in mind. Probably they were uh, placing the implants uh, at right uh, distances. However, they didn't see a correlation. But just looking at this uh, Brady graph that was in the study, you can see this uh, distal implant is placed a lot more coronal compared to the uh, mesial implant. So is there any impact of this vertical discrepancy on this significant bone loss that we see on just this distal implant? This is something that we have to uh, look into. Also another study look at the distances uh, between the implant and the adjacent teeth. They just placed the narrow implant in the lateral side and the central incisor in both maxilla and the mandible. What they found was that when they place the implant closer than a millimeter in proximity to the tooth, they didn't see a negative impact of tooth to implant uh, distance. So they conclude that the distance between the narrow diameter implants and the adjacent teeth would not influence the marginal bone levels. We have to keep that in mind, again, this was a radiographic analysis. So marginal bone loss is a multifactorial uh, parameter that we need to look further into the ideology. We conducted a, a study at the University of Southern California. So our aim was to evaluate the effect of interunit distances on interproximal pre-implant bone level changes. So what we were looking at is that to see whether this vertical discrepancy between the adjacent implant has a negative impact on the uh, marginal bone level or not. So after the IRB approval, we look at the electronic chart. So this was a retrospective radiographic analysis. And we included the implants uh, or restorations when, where they were like two or three unit implant supported restorations. All of them were in the posterior area and they should have had a, a high quality radiograph that the threads were discernible at the time of placement, at the time of uh, the prosthesis delivery and at the final follow up which was at least one year post loading. If there was any kind of bone grafting at the time of implant placement, they were excluded. If the patients were heavy smokers, they were excluded. If the radiographs were not of high quality, they were excluded. And if the implants that were adjacent were placed in different times, of course, we did not include them. So you see in this diagram, we were looking at some parameters that I can show you here. First of all, we included both sprinted and non-sprinted restorations. Why? Because the whole literature shows that there is no significant differences as far as marginal bone level alterations. If we have a sprinted or non-sprinted restorations. So we look at we looked at the horizontal inter-implant distance, the vertical implant discrepancy, as you can see here, and the bone level. That was defined the distance from the implant platform to the first implant bone contact. And we look at the radiographs and we did our measurements in placement time at the prosthesis installation time 
and also in the last follow up which was at least one year post loading so here is a, like an example of what we uh, were looking you can see this is the platform of the mesial implant and the distance to the first bone implant contact was measured this way this is the distal implant and this is the distance from the first bone to implant contact to the platform of the implant. We also measured the vertical discrepancy. We measured the horizontal distance between the implants. And that resulted in uh, 65 patients that were qualified. The mean age was about uh, 60 years old. We had uh, seven uh, different implant systems. So we included the radiographs of two uh, centers, the University of Southern California and a private practice. A total of 153 implants were uh, looked at. Again, going to the results, the horizontal interimplant distance, the mean was 3.36 millimeter, uh, almost about the same as Cardinal Poly uh, study, but the vertical implant discrepancy was 1.44 millimeter, ranging from zero to 3.79 millimeter. We measured the marginal bone loss at three different stages, at the time of placement, at the time of the delivery of the prosthesis, and the last follow-up. As you can see here, the marginal bone loss was about a millimeter from placement to prosthesis installation. And it was 0.27 millimeter from the installation of prosthesis to the uh, final follow-up. And of course it was higher from the placement to final that was 1.31. And what this tells us means that most of the bone loss took place actually in the remodeling phase. That was between the placement and the delivery of the prosthesis. So, this diagram is a very important diagram. Uh, I think this has never been shown in the world before. So here you can see, we look at the whole implants from implant placement to final follow-up. We just look at the horizontal inter-implant distance and marginal bone level. As you can see, there is no correlation between horizontal inter-implant distance and marginal bone level changes. If we just consider the horizontal inter-implant distance. So there should have been a lot more factors to consider. When we broke that down into less than three millimeter versus more than three millimeter, as you see here, again, in three different time frames, in none of them, we didn't reach a statistical significance. But uh, when we looked at the horizontal inter-implant distance, uh, that was less than uh, three millimeter, and we broke it into the marginal bone loss for the coronal implants, that means the implant that was placed slightly more coronal and the apical implant, you can see that uh, the coronal implant actually had more marginal bone loss. And it reached a, a statistical significance at the time of placement to the prosthesis delivery. And of course, placement to final. Again, this shows that the most of the marginal bone level alteration takes place uh, from the placement to the time when we deliver the prosthesis. So typically this is the physiologic remodeling that happens after the implant placement. And if I would, uh, if I want to uh, explain why it happens is basically because of the biologic width formation. So, 
Now we're looking at the horizontal interimplant distance when it is less than three millimeter and we have vertical implant discrepancy, more than a millimeter. Now it's interesting. You can see at all time frames, it reached a statistical significance, meaning that if we place implants close enough with vertical discrepancy, we will have more marginal bone loss. So these two factors hand in hand will result in more marginal bone loss. This was a very uh, interesting finding that we found. This diagram is a cumulative percentage of marginal bone level changes. As you can see, significantly coronal implants in total lost more uh, bone compared to the apical implants. Looking at the vertical implant discrepancy, marginal bone loss with uh, including the whole uh, distances, meaning that we had implants that, we, that had like a two millimeter horizontal distance. We had implants that were placed with seven millimeter distance, implants with five millimeter, they, they were five millimeter apart. So we just look at the vertical implant discrepancy and the marginal bone level. Again, the coronal implant significantly lost more uh, bone compared to the apical implants. Here you can see in cases that the horizontal interimplant uh, distance was less than two millimeter, it didn't reach uh, a statistical significance, but you see the correlation is steeper. And why we didn't reach the statistical significance simply because we didn't have uh, enough samples. So thankfully, the people who placed the implant did not place them too close. Now, looking at the HID, less than three millimeter, and uh, VID, now we see again the coronal implant have lost uh, significantly more bone compared to the apical implants. So that tells us in cases with horizontal implant distance of less than three millimeter and having vertical implant discrepancy, of course, we're gonna have more marginal bone loss on the coronal implant, as you can see in this uh, sample radiograph. Here is another example. You see there is discrepancy between the implants. However, the implants are placed far apart. That's why you don't see uh, marginal bone loss on these implants, even after three or four years of loading. So in cases that the horizontal interimplant distance was more than three millimeter, you see uh, there was no correlation. That tells us if we place the implants far apart, I would say three to four millimeter, at least three, but four is a safe distance. Then even we place the implant with vertical discrepancy, we won't have that detrimental effect of vertical discrepancy. So this is a very important factor that has never been shown before in the world. And uh, we have to consider this in our daily practices. Some other factors might be responsible for marginal bone alterations. For example, the position of the implant relevant to the alveolar bone crest level. This was a preclinical study that was done uh, by uh, David Cochran and his co-workers. So they placed the implants, equicrestal, subcrestal, that was a millimeter below the crest and supracrestal. So here you can see they used two protocols submerged and non-submerged 
And if you look at the numbers, you can see that uh, the implants that were placed uh, subcrestally, they lost more bone. We have to bear that in mind. So this bone loss is not a bad bone loss. Actually, this is a good one because this is as the result of physiologic remodeling. So we lost the bone up to the implant platform. So we won't have any threads exposed in the future. But imagine if you place the implants subcrestally and you lose even a 0.38 millimeter, so already some threads of bone level implants are exposed. So placing the implants at the position of subcrestal, in my opinion, is very important. Another study, this was a human study that was done in the University of Rochester, uh, confirms these findings. So they look at the implants that were placed equicrestal, supracrestal, and subcrestal, and they had 55 patients, 134 implants. And as you can see here, most of the implant sites in the mesial and the distal were subcrestal when they were placed. And 43% of them were placed one stage and 56% were placed uh, two stage. Well, here is what they found. What they found was that when they placed the implants subcrestally, the chances of having the, ex the exposed threads were a lot less for the subcrestal implants. So this is very important to keep that in mind. Placing the implants uh, subcrestally would really benefit us. For conclusion, uh, we concluded that there was a positive correlation between the vertical discrepancy of the adjacent implants and marginal bone loss on the coronal implant. Also, this negative impact of a vertical discrepancy between the adjacent implants showed itself when the implants were placed uh, in a horizontal distance less than three millimeters. So if the implants were placed far apart, this very vertical discrepancy didn't show a detrimental effect. Thus, if we have a clinical situation that we uh, have to place the implants with a vertical discrepancy because of the shape of the ridge or uh, the alveolar uh, crest morphology, we have to make sure that we place them at least four millimeter apart. That will reduce the negative impacts of that vertical discrepancy. So let me show you a case. So this, show, this shows like an easy case. When uh, I wanted to do this case, I was looking, I was thinking of doing a flapless. I would never recommend a flapless on, unless we have like huge amount of keratinized mucosa and huge amount of uh, bone. So here I decided actually to have the flap from the palatal side and take advantage of this uh, nice tissue. The implants were placed subcrestally, as I said, and as you see here, and I did the uh, periosteal tax sutures, as you can see here, to get privileged by that uh, fantastic uh, creatinized mucosa that I had there. So you see, this is the a nice, tissue contour and profile of the implants at the time of impression. And this is the final restoration. Uh, if I want to criticize, they should have made the restoration non-sprinted. That way uh, we would have more uh, interproximal soft tissue and it would have looked nicer. Anyways, they made it this way. 
This is the radiograph that was taken one year post loading. The bone level is stable. And this is what we want in our daily practice. So there might be some clinical scenarios. You know, uh, most of the time in the posterior area, we have a, a slope next to the uh, most distal tooth. So what we can do in these situations, in order to avoid such a vertical discrepancy, we can place two implants far apart and we can have a cantilever. So that way we will avoid those uh, detrimental effects of vertical discrepancy and having a pocket, deep pocket next to the tooth. So this is a clinical scenario that we have to uh, keep in mind that we can use uh, in our daily practices. So I would like to conclude my presentation with some important take home messages. First of all, marginal bone loss is a multifactorial phenomenon. We have to avoid vertical discrepancy in between the adjacent implants. And we have to place the implants subcrestally. And we have to make sure there is enough horizontal distance between the implants if there is any vertical discrepancy. We should not place implants too deep next to the teeth. With that, uh, uh, I will conclude my presentation and I thank you all for your kind attention and for your time. Thank you so much, Vahid. I have to okay. say, I have to say that first of all, listening to you with this amazing topic was a pleasure for me. I'm pretty sure all the audience enjoyed it. It's actually one of my favorite topics and I have to say, it's not a compliment. The way that you present it, I think it was an eye opener for, for most of the surgeons around the world because all of them were, were exactly the facts that we really need to take into consideration and usually we forget about them. So I think it was it was very, very important topic and you presented brilliantly. So um, I have um, some comments actually uh, because I think it, it will be good to open it up a little bit um, for better understanding. So you mentioned, I think it's, it was very important. You mentioned that when we are placing implant adjacent to a tooth, we should not go deeper than three millimeters from the CEJ of the adjacent tooth. And if we go right. deeper, yeah. And if we go deeper, we will face more bone loss. So imagine that we have a case that we are forced to place our implants adjacent to a tooth and we have interproximal bone of that tooth higher, but the level of the bone that we can place our implant is deeper. So the choice here is vertical augmentation or what is the next scenario for this patient? I mean, not, it's not a free end. It's like, a, it's like a only one tooth that we want to replace. Well, if it's a... Posterior area, sometimes we can uh, take advantage of tissue level implants. So then by that transmucosal part, we can uh, actually get some height. And then we don't sacrifice the bone and we don't have much of alteration in the bone. So this is an option in the posterior area, but if it's an anterior, then we have to look what we can do because sometimes tissue level uh, you know in experienced surgeons like with the tissue level implants in the anterior area but it's not easy for everyone so we have to decide based on the clinical scenario 
and and Vahid, uh, um, let me let me say it this way because you mentioned the tissue level implants. If we have enough tissue thickness on top of our implant, can we say that placing even bone level implants can work if we make sure that the tissue height on top of the platform is enough? Yes, because we can come and say that with the abutment. So we have, we need to have like a three millimeter, three or four millimeter of, uh, we have to always provide that biologic width. Mm -hmm. It's like a lot of studies have shown that preclinical and clinical, we need like about three or four millimeter yeah. of tissue height. So yes, we can compensate that height with the taller abutment too. And, um, and, and speaking of inter-implant distances, um, regarding your, your study and the diagrams that I, that I noticed, um, it showed that even if the distance was less than three millimeters in cases that it was two millimeters, it was not really a correlation between the bone loss and the distance. But the recommendation was the more like to four millimeters is better. Am I right? Yes, so uh, the horizontal distance by itself, we show that there is no correlation between the distance and marginal bone loss. However, when it was combined with vertical discrepancy, then there was a positive correlation. That means that when we, uh, the more the vertical discrepancy, we had more marginal bone loss. Yeah, so, so as a recommendation, do you recommend people to insert implants with two millimeter distance? Or if you want to recommend, you don't recommend it ever, never? No, no, not at all, not at all. That doesn't mean, that doesn't mean that we can play the horizontal distance does not matter of course it does matter so in the study of ketosis that i mentioned so they were just looking at the uh, horizontal distance and marginal bone loss yeah okay the bone level was stable even after 24 months but we know that especially in the anterior area. If we place the implants too far, too close, then we will compromise the soft tissue appearance and we won't have a nice soft tissue profile. Actually, this was a part of uh, Osteology Foundation consensus statements that was published in 2018. So what they recommended was that we have to at least place implants three, four millimeter apart in the anterior segment if we want to have interproximal soft tissue between the implants. Mm -hmm. So we yeah. just not, uh, we should not just look at the bone. We have to consider the soft tissue as well. Yeah, you're right. Absolutely. And my, and my final, uh, actually, it's a topic that I think we can talk about it like a day, but, uh, but because our time is limited, so my final point, a question is this, because so many people uh, these days, at least in Iran, I've heard a lot, compare platform switching versus non-platform switching. So I want to know your thought on that. If we have enough soft tissue thickness vertically, if we have enough bone around our implant, then at that point, can we say that conventional implants versus platform switch implants works the same? So we have a studies actually, uh, uh, I know in my mind, the studies by Lenke wishes. So we need to have uh, a good thickness of soft tissue and a good height of soft tissue. Otherwise, platform switching by itself uh, Doesn't work. won't safe because it's 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 very simple you know we need the biologic width formation we yeah. need three four millimeter space for that if not then that biologic width will form by the expense of 
bone loss. But we need that three, four millimeter soft tissue height. So if we don't have it, then the tissue, the bone resorbs and we get that height. Absolutely, you're right. That's, that's exactly the point that uh, I think it's very crucial to know that biological width always exists and we need to have enough tissue height, enough tissue width, enough bone width. And with that said, Vahid, I truly appreciate your, your participation for your beautiful, beautiful presentation. Actually, as I said, it was an eye opener for many of us and uh, great points that help us obtain long-term stability of the outcome that uh, we can in our practice. Appreciate a lot and hope to see you very soon. Thank you so much, Kishan. Uh, I was really uh, privileged to be among this great line of speakers. This uh, was an honor and I uh, would always be proud of it. So I really appreciate your invitation and I wish you best of luck. And we uh, are really privileged to have you uh, as a fantastic uh, clinician, researcher. Uh, you are like, a, I would say, the one of the most important persons in our field so we are really proud of you i thank you again it means a lot thank you take care my friend and see you very soon thank you so, so much so you guys stay safe hope to see you all soon